Okay, well, ladies and gentlemen, let's make a start. Good afternoon. I'm Sandy Roger. I'm the Circular Economy Project Lead for the Toilet Board Coalition. And I'm going to be hosting this webinar over the next 45 minutes about the circular sanitation economy. Now, we have two audiences for this call. So th this, this call is all about bringing together two communities. Some of you will have joined us as part of the Disruptive Innovation Festival, or the DIF. And the DIF is hosted by the Alan MacArthur Foundation, who are the circular economy thought leaders, uh, running, I think, in its third year now. And it's a major online event covering innovation in the circular economy. So if you've joined us through that channel, you're probably wanting to hear about the biological cycle, about biological waste, about how we can get resource flows to work through the economy. And I think we've got some interesting conclusions looking at it through that lens. At the same time, today is part of the Virtual Toilet Business Summit, hosted by the Toilet Board Coalition. And that's a week long series of events building up to World Toilet Day on Sunday. And, and the thread running through the week is the launch of what we call the sanitation economy. So this is a new view of sanitation, a view of sanitation that has a major role for business. And you're gonna hear a little bit more about that in, in a minute. But the circular economy and sanitation meet in this story of the circular sanitation economy, which is what we're really gonna focus on today. Now, so we've said that there are two audiences meeting and you're all very welcome. And I also want to welcome the, the speakers who've joined us uh, for this call. Uh, sitting in the room with me here in London is Charlie Beaver. Charlie heads up marketing for the household cleaning business within Unilever. So that's a, a marketing role in a big global company. Then we have two entrepreneurs. We have uh, David Auerbach, um, who is heading up the company uh, known as Sanergy, based in, in Kenya. And then we have David Drew in South Africa, another entrepreneur, um, working with unique technologies in Cape Town and Durban in South Africa. Okay, so this, the picture is building here. We have a big company guy, we have two entrepreneurs, and then we have Neil McLeod. And Neil is a world expert in how cities can implement sanitation. So he has played a central role over a long period of time in turning Durban into, first of all, one of the cities that is most successful in providing sanitation in the developing world, but also into a hotbed of innovation in doing this in, in new and different ways. Okay, so we've now gone around three corners. We've done big company, we've got entrepreneurs, we've got cities, but for some travel issues, we'd also have um, one of the, the, the toilet board's independent directors, and Neil, by the way, is also an independent director, but we would also have Pascal Giffon from France, who, who was until recently with Suez, and who is an expert in this field from the operator's point of view. I think the old language for that would be utilities, but the people that run these big infrastructural systems. So now we've got four different communities represented. So is this some kind of new collaboration emerging here, some kind of new ecosystem of organizations? Well, exactly that's what it is, and that's why we have this set of speakers here today. So we're going to, we're going to work our way around them in, in a few minutes, but what I'm going to do first of all is to hand you over to Charlie. Um, Charlie is the chair of the Toilet Board Coalition. He's going to tell us a little bit about the Toilet Board Coalition itself, for those that don't already know us. And then he's going to introduce this overarching concept that we're launching this week, the sanitation economy. So over to Charlie. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, so very warm welcome to all of those who've joined us. Um, I've uh, been involved in the Toilet Board Coalition uh, for the last four years since its uh, launch. Uh, so Unilever was one of the founding members of it. And it's a coalition of uh, organizations uh, with a very shared and common goal, which is to find ways to uh, contribute to uh, solving the world, uh, the world sanitation crisis 
uh, but particularly through a bringing a business lens to it. So obviously there's an enormous amount of uh, work, experience, investment coming from governments, uh, coming from NGOs. Um, but one of the uh, areas that we saw that led us to believe that, that we could add to the, uh, uh, the, the program uh, in bringing universal sanitation to all would be if we could bring together a coalition of organizations, businesses, uh, big and small, uh, sanitation entrepreneurs, um, sanitation experts, and Neil is one of them present here, um, and then also uh, investment uh, development banks and, uh, and some government funding bodies. So that coalition has been uh, working together since uh, 2014, uh, and uh, we have been working in quite a number of areas, starting off with uh, the uh, identification and, uh, and partnering with some of the leading uh, entrepreneurs in this field, and we're we're lucky to have two of them joining us uh, today, um, supporting some of these organizations through what we call our Toilet Accelerator Program, which is really uh, bringing together some of the uh, expertise and mentoring skills and business skills from uh, large established uh, organizations, um, and really partnering with the nimble, agile uh, companies on the ground who are uh, innovating in this, uh, in this much needed space. Um, so that's one of the things that uh, we have been doing. But what we've also been doing uh, is identifying how we can really open up the thinking, uh, tap into a lot of the experience and expertise that uh, exists around the world uh, and, and has been building up over decades, but really give it uh, fresh insight and, uh, and, and fresh momentum by potentially joining some of the dots that haven't been joined before um, or uh, unlocking a partnership and collabor uh, collaboration in new ways. And so that's why uh, today we're, we're particularly excited to, uh, to share some of the thinking around around uh, what we're calling the sanitation economy. Um, and uh, the sanitation economy is at, at its simplest level, a marketplace, uh, a robust marketplace of products and services, um, uh, data and information, and particularly importantly, renewable resource flows. Um, and we believe that this combination of uh, these three distinct areas uh, can play a role in transforming the future uh, future cities communities and uh, and businesses and do it in a way that is uh, sustainable uh, innovative uh, and actually can generate employment and uh, and and use a wealth of resource that is currently going wasted so i just really wanted to break the sanitation economy down uh, into three uh, pillars uh, so the first is uh, the toilet economy the second, the circular sanitation economy, uh, and the final one, the smart sanitation economy. And in a minute, we'll come on to a, a little uh, diagram that brings that together. But firstly, let me just talk you through some of the underlying principles behind these three pillars. So the toilet economy uh, is, is very much the provision of toilet products and services, uh, uh, and including innovation in that space. Um, that really uh, provides a, uh, a range of toilets that are fit for purpose, fit for the context. And we know that that can vary enormously from a rural context to an urban context, from South Asia to Sub-Saharan Africa or even uh, Peru. So uh, there's, a, there's a, a breadth of options and, uh, and flexibility to really match the right solution with the, with the needs of, uh, of the users. Um, what it also does uh, is it uh, covers uh, both centralized and decentralized systems, sewered and non-sewered systems. Um, and, and so that flex, if there was a one size fix all, uh, it would have already been done by now. And I think what the sanitation economy recognizes is that you need that diversity of solutions in terms of products and service provision that allow uh, communities, towns, cities to flex and bring in what they need to really uh, deliver that sustainable, uh, sustainable city. Um, and particularly importantly, the way in which those systems are set up uh, must, uh, we, we believe it's particularly important that they are set up thinking of the circular sanitation economy, which brings me on to the second pillar. Um, and here I just wanted to, to, to share maybe a, a simple rebranding thought, but that we think is very important. One of the most commonly used words in the sanitation world is human waste. Um, and it, the way in which we treat it today I think makes that an appropriate name. 
However, we want to challenge that and actually turn it on its head and say, we view this as toilet resource. Uh, that is part of the buyer cycle. Um, as uh, some of the colleagues we've worked with, after all, it's, it's, it's basically digested tomatoes and other things, um, uh, which are very much part of the buyer cycle. And if the toilet economy is set up in a way that uh, is designed to feed into a system uh, that is set up for the circular sanitation economy, that's where a huge amount of value and opportunity uh, gets unlocked. Uh, so this is about connecting the bio cycle, recovering, uh, waste, uh, re recovering nutrients and water from what we have typically called human waste, and then generating uh, really value added products out of that, whether that be renewable energy, organic fertilizers, proteins, and you'll hear, you'll hear more about that from some of our speakers in a minute. And then the final part is that in the 21st century, of course, you would expect digitization to play a part of it. But how can that really, ha how can that really help in toilets? Well, I think as we've really uh, explored this space, uh, many opportunities have opened up, some of which are quite well established and some of which are very early exploratory phases. But for sure, uh, the uh, data flow uh, and, uh, and smart systems can help to uh, set up uh, efficiencies for the organizations, uh, whether they be a, a container-based sanitation organization or a decentralized uh, operation. Um, uh, in their uh, logistics, their maintenance uh, and operation. But we also believe, and we're working uh, with IBM on this and a few other partners, that there is the potential to use uh, special uh, measurement devices uh, built into the toilet to also pick up uh, on uh, health data, uh, potentially identify outbreaks of certain diseases sooner, um, and provide city authorities with the opportunities to, uh, to, to, to become more predictive and intervene, and maybe, who knows, uh, personal level uh, health data. So a really broad uh, ecosystem um, and something that we are uh, titling uh, the sanitation economy. Sandy. That works even better if I unmute. Thank you very much. So the, the, the three boxes that you saw there on, on Charlie's slide are also represented in this infographic. You can see the three circles. The, the print is far too small to read on your screens now, but th this is uh, available and will be available in the various reports we're, we're publishing. And what, what you'll see if you get hold of this and the, and the sort of uh, derived uh, diagrams is lots of examples and case studies and so forth. So this is a, a very much an emerging picture the, the, the sanitation economy. So if we go to the next uh, slide, Alex, what, what we're doing this week is we're actually launching not one but three reports. Uh, now the black one you can see on the left hand side, that is the overview of the sanitation economy um, and we launched that on, on Tuesday of this week. And then the other two are the ones that bring us towards the conversation that we're really having this afternoon. So on the right hand side, the purple report, which was launched yesterday, um, is about India, and it's about estimates of the potential markets around sanitation in India. And then the one in the middle, the green one, which we're really going to focus on today, is about the circular sanitation economy. But these go as a set, um, and there's quite a lot of cross-referencing between them. They will all be on the Toilet Board's website uh, on Sunday, World Toilet Day. Um, so, you know, do go and have a, have a look. If it's not your idea of a, a, a weekend reading, then go on Monday, please, and, and have a look at these uh, reports. But let's, let's now talk about the, the green and a little bit about the purple reports and really get into the circular economy conversation. So, Alex, if we can go to the next graphic. Now, this is a graphic lifted out of the circular sanitation economy report. And if you look down the left-hand side, what you can see is that it's a scale with global at the top and small, you might say local, at the bottom. So this is, this is a kind of hierarchy of scale that we're looking at. And in these big conversations about systemic change, what, what often happens is at the top level is we have some huge numbers. So the Alan MacArthur Foundation over the last five or six years has produced a series of reports with help from McKinsey and the World Economic Forum and so on, which have in, added layers and layers of understanding to the circular economy. And if you add up the potential prize for implementing the circular economy, it's well up over a trillion dollars. So it's a huge economic opportunity. The same is true in the sanitation space. So not having sanitation is a major drag on the economy. The health consequences of people having shorter, less productive lives 
drags down the economy of cities and countries. And the World Bank have looked at this, our, one of our member companies, Lixel, has, has looked at this. And the numbers there, again, are huge, over 200 billion benefit from improving sanitation. So these numbers sit at the top of the page and inspire us that there is a real opportunity here, an economic opportunity. If you jump right down to the bottom, we have entrepreneurs who are trying to make businesses work. They need to monetize these benefits. They need to have revenues flowing into their business to pay their employees and satisfy their investors. And the challenge can be to link the top and the bottom of this chart, because sometimes these huge numbers seem a long way away and seem pretty much like externalities that it's very hard to turn into a revenue you know, for, for my cash flow tomorrow. So what we've been trying to do this, this year with the work that we've done with these two studies is to bridge the gap. So what we've done with the, the green report, and it's in the green boxes here, is we've started with a set of small businesses, and I'll introduce them in a minute. We've looked inside their business models. And these are small businesses. Plenty of people have looked at these businesses before. They will tell you that at this scale, these businesses have a hard job to be profitable. Well, that's true of small businesses in almost any sector. It's not unique to sanitation. The interesting question is, if you scale them up, will they be profitable? And the work we've done, bringing them up to a notional scale of around a city of 3 million people, not a particular city, just a kind of notional bit of modeling work, if you like, suggests that actually, yes, they can be profitable at that scale. Then we have the study of India. Now, this is just looking at one market, and, and I'm, I'm being careful not to, to, to say that this applies you know, in exactly the same way everywhere in the world. But here we have a huge opportunity for the products and services derived from sanitation, um, you know, nine to, to, to $28 billion, uh, it says there. And that's just for the revenues to sanitation. There's a whole lot of other components of the sanitation economy which are additional to, to that. If you translate that down to a city of three million, then you're looking at 19 to 60 million. And there's a wide range because there's lots of different products available and appropriate in different markets. So what are we saying here? What we're saying here is that if the small businesses scale up, they can be profitable and they can be businesses with revenues in the millions or even tens of millions of dollars. So that sounds like um, real potential here for something that will work economically and potentially be self-sustaining economically much more than we have traditionally thought that sanitation could be. So that's the essence of what we've been trying to do this year with these two studies. They're designed to meet at this 3 million scale and, and, and create a sense of what is possible at a city scale. Okay, so let's turn to the, to the next chart. Now, um, these are the companies we've been working with. We don't do this, this work in a vacuum. Um, we do it with companies who we're collaborating with closely. And the four across the top there, Sanovation, Safisana, Sanergy, and the Biocycle, have been our cohort of um, circular economy companies this year. They're all, all in Africa. Two of them are represented on the call here today, and you'll hear more about them in, in a few minutes. But we have been right inside their numbers to do this work. And indeed, we've also had numbers from Soil, who are a similar organization working in Haiti. We've had a lot of help from Borda, who are a German-based organization, but, but their work, a lot of it is in India, and we've had their, their numbers from there. And also EY, the global consulting firm, who've done a, a study in this space earlier this year, also helped us with numbers. So we've been able to pull together the numbers from these sources and do some modeling. Now, if you read the reports, the, 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 the green circular economy uh, report, you will probably be disappointed not to see lots and lots of these numbers. But the reason is these are commercial businesses. Um, we have been given confidential access to their data and we've derived insights from the modeling, but we're not able to share the actual data. We can't tell you what their prices are and what their costs are. So um, that's the limitation of getting you know, right inside business data that you can't necessarily disclose it publicly. And that, that's the reality of, of the work that we've done here. Okay, so that's enough of a setup. What are our findings from this work? And I'm going to take you through these just on this one page, and then you can read the reports and, and get much more detail. So the first point, number one, is, as I said a moment ago, it turns out that at scale, these businesses can be profitable. And what I mean by that is that they can meet all their costs, they can pay the depreciation and, 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 and the cost of capital, and yield an 8% return. 
It doesn't mean that they can do that entirely without subsidy. Um, and the, the report details, you know, how that subsidy might be structured around toilet provision and, and so forth. But normal sanitation systems are all subsidy in effect, or they're all public cost. This is a, this is a system where quite a lot of the cost is offset by revenues and subsidy is needed to kind of close the last gap. So yes, there's a subsidy, but it's much smaller than for traditional sanitation systems. And on that basis, these businesses can be profitable at scale. And of course, that then brings in the potential for private investment into the system. The second finding, these work within what we're calling the new grid. Now, the old grid, I suppose, in, in um, sanitation terms, would be a traditional sewer network. You can also go to the other extreme and go off grid and build very isolated toilet units, which perhaps even do their own treatment uh, on site, but certainly don't depend on connectivity with wider systems. What we're advocating is a kind of hybrid solution, exactly as Charlie said before. So it's not that there's anything wrong with those new designs of toilets, nor that there's anything specifically wrong with sewers. It's just that their systems, which by themselves are really difficult to scale up. Sewers are big systems, a lot of money, a lot of concrete needs to be poured, a lot of upfront commitment is needed. The off-grid systems are difficult to scale up because they are very fragmented. You end up trying to solve a huge problem, almost kind of one village at a time. What we envisage is this new grid, which is material, energy, and information flows. It's a circular economy approach. It's also integrated with the smart cities thinking, so the information flows are important as well. And we believe that this is an easier system to scale up, both physically and financially. So that's the second finding. The third finding, which comes back really to my introduction, is that this creates a new ecosystem. So this is not just the world of cities and utilities, as we might think of it in, in, in the old language. This is a business opportunity, but still collaborating with the cities and the operators. And it's also very much about large and small businesses. The small businesses, as, you, as you're going to hear in a moment, are the entrepreneurs, the innovators, the people with the close community connections, which allow them to create a new service model, even beginning to change the local culture around sanitation. But the big companies have, have a big part to play in this as well, and lots to gain. So there are new opportunities for them to sell products, new opportunities for new renewable materials and, and, and services, um, new consumer insights, um, new access to, to, to consumers with, with growing incomes. So um, big business has a big part to play in this, and, and big business can help the system by making commitments and helping the small companies to scale up. So this is an ecosystem with these four different types of organizations. And the key thing is no one of them can do this in isolation. It does depend on the collaboration of the four. The final part, and th this is really where the circular economy story uh, gets to its, its biggest impact, is that this builds a working biological cycle. And I think there are two, com two key parts of that that we should talk about. The first is that this is about returning nutrients to the soil. And some of you may know the history that when the London sewers were built a long time ago, there were scientists, scientists who even looked back to Roman times, who said, this is the wrong thing to do. What you're doing is building a system that flushes the nutrients off the soil into the sea via food and by, by people's bodies. But we went ahead and, and have built sewers. The, the system that we're talking about here is one that catches those nutrients and gets them back to the soil. So this is closing the loop of the biological cycle. The other consequence um, of building sewers, arguably, is that having got that part of biological waste under control, we never really got our heads around the rest of biological waste. And to this day, we talk about problems with food waste. To this day, we have sporadic collection of biological materials to the point that if people try and make um, you know, packaging from, from bioplastics, they end up being a contaminant in the recycling system. So we haven't actually got our heads around biological waste properly ever since we built the sewers a long time ago in developed countries, in developing countries, sorry, developed countries. Um, in developing countries, we haven't built the infrastructure yet, either the sewers or the other waste systems. So what about building an integrated biological waste system? And the interesting thing is, 
all of these entrepreneurs we're working with, not out of any grand circular economy ambition, but simply because it works, are doing exactly that. They are taking waste from sanitation and they're taking waste from companies and markets and other farms and other sources and they're processing it together. And that's what produces actually a better product as well as a more resilient and, and potentially more profitable business. So those are the four key findings. I'm not gonna go into them in any more detail now. Do please uh, uh, get online at the weekend and get these reports. But now what I'm gonna do is, is uh, turn you over to some of the people that are actually doing some of these things. Um, and uh, if he has joined us, and he did warn us there were some issues with Nairobi traffic today, um, I'm going to turn you over, first of all, um, to, to David Auerbach yeah. at Sanergy. And what the, these guys are going to do is, is tell you a little bit about their businesses and then just make one or two comments sort of feeding back on the, this new thinking about the sector sanitation economy. So, uh, David, over to you. Uh, great. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. My name is David Auerbach. I'm one of the co-founders of Sanergy uh, here in Nairobi, Kenya. Um, what we're all about is how do you find a way to provide safe set sanitation to residents of informal settlements or, or urban slums. Um, and <clears throat> as Sandy outlined, uh, the typical approach to being able to solve the sanitation challenge is sewers. And sewers are both prohibitively expensive, uh, coming in at a price point of at least $56 per person per year, whereas the spending in Kenya on water and sanitation is $3 per person per year. And even if you had the money, uh, it is impractical given that um, you know, these, these informal settlements are extremely built up, um, uh, densely populated. So it's gonna be very difficult to install uh, uh, significant infrastructure projects. Uh, and I believe we have Neil McLeod on the line too, and he's the foremost expert on this. Um, and so what we do uh, 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 as a model is that we franchise low cost high quality waterless or dry toilets to residents of informal settlements. So it's a community investment model. They operate the toilets, they keep them clean, safe and open. Uh, and we then provide a, uh, a, a professional waste collection service. So just about every day come to each of the toilets and in a safe manner that is, uh, we, we seal cartridges, put them on hand carts and then put them on trucks where we take it out to a waste processing plant. Uh, it's a pretty seamless process. Uh, people often think that we are transporting ice cream uh, rather than uh, waste, uh, and and uh, which speaks to the, the quality of the service. Once we get the waste out uh, to the processing plant, we are converting it into useful end products, uh, pr predominantly organic fertilizer, um, which uh, we are able to do through a semi-automated uh, thermophilic composting process. Uh, we take that uh, it takes about uh, a few months to produce, uh, and the end product is both safe, certified, and nutrient-rich. Uh, and we're seeing farmers having an increase in crop yields of about 30%. And so at this point, uh, we're uh, serving about 50,000 people every day with safe sanitation through a network of 1,400 toilets just in one corner of, uh, of, of Nairobi. Uh, we're processing something like 6,000 tons of waste a year into the uh, end products, which we're then selling on, and we're working with about a thousand farmers right now. Uh, the toilet board has been really influential in helping us uh, uh, across a number of things. First of all, you know they've identified some fantastic mentors for us. Uh, Neil McLeod being one, um, uh, who used to be the head of water and sanitation for the city of Durban, and he's taken his insights uh, and is bringing that to our work here in Nairobi. He was actually visiting us last week and. Uh, we had just the most productive meetings I've ever had with government um, in, given because of his credibility and experience. Uh, and then secondly, we're starting to work with uh, the toilet board on, on, on how we develop waste management contracts um, with, with cities. Uh, and, and they have experts on that who are able to provide support. And then the last thing that the toilet board's been doing for us is actually bringing together a working group uh, around the regulatory standards around exported end products. So, uh, into, into the European market. Uh, so making it easier for us to be able to sell our fertilizer and other ag products, which if you look along the value chain and, and uh, <clears throat> uh, you know, it's not just us and farmers who are wanting that, but also progressive businesses like Unilever too. David, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, so, so let me go 
to the other David, the other entrepreneur in Africa, uh, David Drew. Sorry, I was just finding an unmute button. Hello, all. Um, so I'm David Drew. Uh, a lot of people call me Wilco. What, what are we? So we, we, we are nutrient recyclers. That's all we are. And I'll, I'll get back to exactly what nutrient recycling involves in, in, in just a sec. But basically, we, we take insects and turn waste streams into, into three products. Well, the first thing we turn them into is, is maggots. We make a lot of maggots, about 20 tonnes a day of them. And, and then what we do is we refine those maggots. That's our biological process that and these maggots grow on, uh, on waste streams. And we refine them into, into three products. We, we unimaginatively call these products mag soil, which is the leftover soil um, of the result of our process, which is an awesome compost, um, a soil enricher. It's not quite a fertilizer, but it's damn close. Uh, mag oil, the oil that we extrude from the maggots, it's extremely high in stuff called lauric acid and really good for feeding to agricultural animals in their very early stages of growth. Um, for example, chicks, uh, fingerlings in the fish world, uh, baby piglets. Lauric acid, to give you an idea, which is about 35-36% uh, inclusion rate in our oils, is only found higher in two places naturally. One is in coconut oil, which is the new yoga craze that everybody understands very well. And the other one is breast milk, of course. And we all know that breast is best. Um, and that's extraordinary. It's what creates the gut in your stomach that gives you that DNA fingerprint that is ultimately what defines us is our gut uh, and the health that comes from it. And the last piece is the meal, which is basically nothing more exciting than uh, dried maggots. It's the natural food of fish and various other um, animals, including chickens that have specifically uh, grown uh, and evolved to have the feet and the beaks that they do to be able to peck and find maggots. So that's really what we do, nutrient recycling. We take a waste source, why we do it? We're specifically keen on keeping down the costs of inflation where recycling doesn't exist. We all understand glass recycling very well. If it didn't, we didn't have glass recycling. If you bought a bottle of whiskey, the whiskey on a cheap bottle would probably cost less than the glass it came in. Plastic recycling without it, you would without doubt be paying three to four times more for the bottle of uh, plastic um, than the water intained in it in a mineral water on the corner shop. And that's really what we want to do with nutrient recycling is stop throwing away nutrients to be able to bring down the price of ingredients into the food that we eat because most people don't always get the definition. definition. Feed, that's what humans eat. Food, that, sorry, food, that's what humans eat. Feed, that's what animals eat. Uh, unless, of course, you've been uh, pounced on by Nestle and the others because we talk about pet food because they want us to think about it in terms of human consumption rather than animal consumption. But on the whole, we spend too much time using the nutrients of our seas specifically, and this is our big thing because our mag meal is a 100% total substitute for fish meal. Just to give you an idea that by weight, that's by captured weight of fish taken from the sea each year, 50% of all of the fish from the sea go to make food for humans. That's us having fish and chips. And 50% go to make feed for the animals that we in turn eat. And we can't sustain that. It's pretty straightforward. And all we've got plenty of fish in the sea. We just need to start eating it ourselves and not giving it to the animals that we in turn need. So thanks very much today for the uh, the, the reports that you've done. I specifically resignate, resignate uh, with the toilet board's work on scale and profitability. On the one hand, it doesn't uh, take a rocket scientist to help uh, understand economies of scale. But there is absolutely no profitability and there is only one way pain until you get over extraordinarily large first steps in this world. Uh, and it's nice to see that uh, in black and white and with some very grown up thinking behind it. And then also uh, the other piece that resonated me uh, nicely was the, the, the piece that uh, Sandy put forward about uh, and, and also Charlie uh, mentioned about how large companies, entrepreneurs, operators and governments work together. Uh, I'm a bit dubious about some of that because I'm not sure that uh, large companies, entrepreneurs, operators and governments work very well independently, let alone when you put them all together in one place. Uh, and I'd love to be part of uh, some of the solution finding that, that uh, sits in and around how we can learn from each other's mistakes. So uh, thanks very much for the invitation to be here today. Thank you very much to, to, to both Davids. Now, 
Um, I, I have had a, a little word in my ear while while the two Davids have been speaking that we may have actually lost Neil McLeod on the on the connection. I know he's dialing in from somewhere, I think, in Africa. Um, can I just check now? Do we have Neil McLeod on the line? It sounds as though we we don't. Well, that that's a, a, a great shame. We I think all of us were building up to that. You've heard various glowing remarks about Neil, and he is a, a, a real world expert in in this field. Um, let me just say a couple of things, perhaps in lieu of, of Neil, and, and perhaps David Drew, I, I might just come back to you at the end of that, because perhaps you, I'll give you a moment to think about it, but perhaps you could just tell us a little bit more about what's been happening in Durban and how that's been set up working with the city in, in Durban, because that's a really important relationship, which I think has, has opened a lot of doors to this new, new system. So, so Neil, as um, I think David, David Auerbach said, was the head of water and sanitation in Durban. Um, they, they are a, a city with all sorts of legacies over many years of, of um, poor sanitation provision. Um, and, and as we see in um, many places, even where toilets were provided, what was lacking was, was the treatment facilities. And um, so the, the danger with that, of course, is you simply move the problem from one place to another. Uh, you may have a toilet in somebody's house, but then you have a polluted river or you create another problem and that gets back into the water system. So, um, you know, I think the World Health Organization statistics are that 2.3 billion people in the don't have toilets, but 4.1, I think, is the number who don't have toilets with treatment. So what Neil and his colleagues in Durban have been doing is trying to develop both the toilet provision in South Africa and also in, in, in Durban and also the, um, the, the treatment. And this has been an outstandingly innovative process. Um, I, I visited there um, a few months ago. We were part of the International Standards Organization team working in this area. And we had a day organized by another uh, Durban maestro of this, Professor Chris Buckley at the University of KwaZulu-Natal. And there are literally dozens of innovative projects in the Durban area, um, changing the way that sanitation works and providing um, better facilities for, for people in that area. So it's a real, a real hotbed of innovation. So I'm, I'm sorry that Neil um, can't be with us. Hopefully that gives you at least a taster of the sort of work that he's been doing. He's also been, I know, a huge supporter, uh, David, of the biocycle and of the work that you've done. So David, do, do, do you want to just add a, add a, you know, a minute or so just, just from the side of that? Yeah. Um, just to, uh, just, just, just be clear. So, so I, I co-founded and, and, and run a business called AgriProtein. Within that, uh, we're quite unusual because AgriProtein uh, doesn't have any profit, uh, and yet we have a not-for-profit arm, um, which uh, Charlie, at least, is there at least has a, a not-for-profit driver, but has a profit arm to, 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 <laughs> to finance it with. Uh, our not-for-profit arm that Mark runs um, is uh, specifically looks within our business at alternative waste streams. So AgriProtein takes only the cleanest organic uh, waste streams that it can lay its hands on, that's fresh fruit, vegetables and the likes. And Mark runs our alternative um, supply chain uh, or, or, or special situations, the AgriProtein special situations, which uh, rather unfortunately spells ask, but rather actually usefully because uh, that does um, gel straight back into what we do in Durban, which is uh, we have a facility there that has capacity to take on about 30 tonnes of um, human faecal matter a day. I really like the word uh, toilet resource uh, that Charlie used. Um, I, I, from our side, we, we slightly want to get away from the word toilet because we are, we're a, again, I'm going to use another pun here, we are a back-end solution provider. So as, as, as you quite rightly said, Sandy, uh, whatever front end you may have, whether it's a posh, um, Armitage Shanks unit or um, one of Sanergy's awesome units the, the, the issue is you still end up with a pile of poo at the back of it and, and that's really where we start to work. Um, we've done some great work with KZN they are very forward thinking they are very well plugged into um, the innovation world um, from Seattle and the Gates guys right through Switzerland and the toilet board uh, privately and governmentally so they've been they've been great to work with um, we are uh, very engaged with them. They bring us the sludge that we operate our facility with in Durban. David, thank you. That, that's excellent. So, so sorry we missed Neil McLeod, but you've got at least a sense of how a city can play its part in this, in this innovation and, and in the relationships that are building up here with, with um, uh, private companies uh, such as uh, the BioCycle. So, okay, so we've been round the corners of this this ecosystem. We've we've got more of a sense of it. We're running a little bit over time, so I'm not I'm not going to labour the next point at any length. But 
at the end of the day, what this report talks about is scale up, right? It says, let, let's stop worrying about what these businesses look like when they're tiny. Let's focus on making them bigger. Let's focus on getting them up to that city scale where they can be profitable and where there are real markets to be accessed and in the process, real huge benefits in terms of sanitation provision. So we're focused on the scale up. And um, we have uh, just in, in August announced our collaboration with the city of Pune in India, uh, the world's first smart sanitation city. And that will be another test bed of, of these ideas. And the toilet board is, is also working on a number of other potential projects, some of them city scale projects, some of them what we call facility scale projects. So this is where um, a major industrial operation, um, one of them is a, a mining community, another one is a, is a, a major plantation, uh, sets up with a sanitation business of the kind we've been hearing about, and they get all these resource flows working. So um, the, the sanitation provided for the employees in the community, um, energy flows, water flows, um, compost for, for growing, you know, whatever is appropriate to the circumstances. But the owner of the mine or the plantation or the factory acts as a kind of anchor client, a little bit fulfilling the role that a city authority might do in, in, in a city situation. And, and that's another potential stepping stone. So we're working on these facility contracts and these municipality contracts. Both of those are described uh, in, in the report. And so we as the toilet board are really driving now to make this scale up happen. And we would very much welcome the interest of other parties who can, can see how they might contribute in this ecosystem. Um, we, we are a very small organization and the leverage uh, of what we do comes through collaboration with others. And we would, we would really be interested to hear from others who want to, to play a part in this. So on, on the scale up point, I'm, I'm not gonna go right around the whole group again, but I mean, Charlie, I'm just wondering if there's anything you might want to just add about you know, how the toilet board is taking this um, forward and how we're gonna help the scale up process. So I think a couple of thoughts. The first of them is that the Pune initiative uh, in India is, uh, I, th I think, a, we hope it will be a very valuable contribution to uh, putting into practice uh, the, the thinking that is uh, in this report. Um, and I think if we can prove that at a citywide level, that will be an enormous step forward uh, to mobilize other cities to uh, look at similar initiatives. Um, because ultimately, and uh, one of the key themes coming through from War World Water Week in Stockholm in uh, September was, was this idea of uh, inclusive citywide sanitation. Um, and which, which ultimately is what you need for sanitation to, to deliver sustainable benefits. Um, and so I think that that's what we're most excited about in, um, in the Pune initiative. And then also if you complement that with uh, the fantastic work that, uh, that David and Wilco are doing uh, in uh, East Africa and South Africa, um, some of which can potentially feed into Pune as well. So it's this whole ecosystem getting moving. Um, I think communication is gonna be key. So to continue to share quite openly as, as we go, um, and really, uh, as you said just a minute ago, leverage the all of those who have a shared interest and, and really source the ideas uh, that can help uh, deliver against the objective so exciting times experimental times um, but uh, I think we're, we're, we're confident that some some real value will come out of this Charlie thank you that that's excellent um, we're, we're very near the end of this now what, what I'm going to do ju just for one moment is to turn you over to my colleague in the toilet board uh, coalition team Alex Snezovic uh, Alex do you want to just tell us about the remaining activities over the next few days leading up to World Toilet Day um, and, and perhaps about how people can then access these reports when they become available. Absolutely, I'd be happy to. Thank you, Sandy. Uh, so as Sandy mentioned at the opening of this webinar, uh, we are in the midst of the first virtual toilet business summit. So we've had a number of events throughout the week online, uh, live stream, much like the one you're watching today. And those are all available um, now. Um, they were available live as well, of course, but available afterwards for viewing on YouTube, on our YouTube channel, or you can also find them on our website. Uh, tomorrow we have one final event, which we're very excited about, which is the announcement of our 2018 Toilet Accelerator cohort. As Sandy mentioned, uh, David Arbach was 
a member of the 2017 cohort. Uh, each year we bring in a new group of entrepreneurs and businesses and work with them in a one-on-one -on -one bespoke uh, manner uh, between our multinational companies and the entrepreneurs themselves. So we'll be announcing that 2018 cohort, which we'll begin working with in January tomorrow uh, after, oh, tomorrow morning um, on our, it'll be on the same YouTube channel that you're on right now. And as we mentioned, there have been a number of events already this week. So in case you missed it, um, we direct you to our website, toiletboard.org. Uh, on the news page are links to all of the different resources and events that have happened. So you can find them there and watch them at your leisure throughout the weekend. And coming to the weekend, as World Toilet Day is on a Sunday, we've decided to take over the entire weekend. And what we've done is offered to sort of give you our website. So you are the sanitation economy, you are the entrepreneurs, the enablers, the different buyers and sellers in this sanitation economy. And we wanna hear from you. We wanna learn about who you are and your business and where you see that you fit in that larger economy. So please go to the website, download the sanitation economy materials. Uh, we have a new page on the site just dedicated to the sanitation economy. So you can learn about it there and then upload a. 30 second to one minute video to YouTube with toilet takeover in the title, and it will automatically be added to our playlist, which will take over our website. You'll just have to come and see what that looks like um, on Friday through Monday of, of this weekend. So with that, I hand it back to you, Sandy. Alex, thanks very much. So lot, lots going on. Do, do stay involved in this, uh, not only through the weekend, but, but uh, beyond that, we really do want to hear from uh, people who are interested in, in getting involved from all corners of that ecosystem that I described before. So, um, well, that's, that's it for today. You've, you've heard about the circular economy and you've heard about sanitation and you've heard about if you put the two together, you get a system that potentially is a game changer. And that's what we're gonna be working on uh, in the year ahead, uh, do come and get involved. Thanks very much.